So if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to try to, to share my screen. Um, seeing how we can't go to the field, um, I'm trying to bring the field to you. And so hopefully everything works. Um, this morning when we were using the internet, we were getting a black bar across the top of our um, PowerPoint, but it would go away so you could still see the rest of your PowerPoint. We tried it this afternoon and we didn't have any of the black bars coming across our PowerPoint. So um, that's what I'm gonna roll into next is I'm gonna roll into um, our PowerPoint that has our plant ID. And we do have some videos that hopefully will still work in here. Um, like I said, I started working for Pheasants Forever in 2013. And in 2013 in June, I was supposed to host a habitat tour. So um, I did the first couple of years. And then, like I said, I decided to do uh, more of a tour that I wanted to attend and um, came up with talking to Donna out here at the beverage barn. And the first year that we did it, we did a make and take project. We actually did the tasting out here, but we also did make and take herb gardens. So Donna had pots, soil, and four to five different herb plants that you could take home and she charged us $5. And so we were able to talk about pollinators and we were able to um, go ahead and, and sample some of the beverages. So I know that first year she had like a non-alcoholic mojito. Um, I think she did a couple of meads and then I think we did some kind of a beer. There you go, it's, something's happening. Okay. Now, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect, thank you. So here's just some definitions. I'm just gonna leave this up for just a little bit. It talks about um, whether it's an annual, a, bi a biennial, a forb, a grass, or grass-like plants. Um, mostly what we're gonna be talking about this evening is our forbs and um, kind of what we're finding typically in Southwest Nebraska. And then here's a few more definitions. The definition of a legume, um, the natives, if it's, it's a re occurring naturally in Nebraska and not introduced, if it's naturalized, a perennial, a rhizome, or a stolen. And then we'll roll right into some of a lot of the plants that you'll see in the in our presentation this evening are the plants that we found when we were out on our wildflower walk. So this is American licorice. And on the left is, so I don't know if you guys wanna come around, how are you guys wanna do this? American licorice is um, a native perennial. And on the left is what it looks like this time of the year. So it does have a white bloom. Um, and then on the right is what it looks like more in the fall. So the pieces that look like black are actually like those seed pods. And then that's what they start looking like when they get ready to drop those seed pods. Yeah, yeah, and, and we just find them sporadically. It's not something that we necessarily put in our um, plantings, but it's some that have popped up that in our plantings. And these, I actually found um, this one um, along the ditch. Um, but there is some down at Shona's. So Shona's, you do have some of this American licorice in um, your pollinator field. Um, this is an American plum. This is a shrub and hopefully we'll get this to work. This is actually, um, in Nebraska we have, through Pheasants Forever, we have a Corners for Wildlife program where landowners can enroll their um, pivot corners into a habitat project. And part of the things that we do with our habitat projects is we plant shrub thickets. And this one was actually planted in 2018. And this one has done really, really well. This is like a shining star. Um, this is an American plum. And I'll just start the video. Hopefully it works. And then you guys can see us as we take a walk through this shrub thicket. So this is the plants themselves that were actually machine planted. And then these little pieces down here are the little suckers. So. Plum and choke cherry typically will sucker from their roots and then we'll enclose this whole canopy eventually and have a really nice thicket. These have done really well. Um, these are pretty good, pretty good size. These are closer to the edge of the pivot, so I don't know maybe if they get a little bit more water from the end gun, possibly, but they're pretty far away from it. But this is, like I said, this is a shining star. This is one of our really nice shrub thickets that's done really well. It's a shining star because it's a really good one. <laughs> um, this is bush morning glory. So if you've ever seen regular morning glory and more, regular morning glory is actually climb. So 
you usually put them up a lattice um, or they climb up an arbor. And this one is actually shaped like a bush. So when you actually see it, you usually see it later in the summer here. Um, it's really pretty. It's really pink. It's, it catches your eye when you're out there. And it's, it is really shaped like a bush. It's really round. Um, the morning glory, the shape of the blossom is about the same thing as the a regular climbing morning glory, but their, their shape, the way they grow is completely different. Um, Black-eyed Susan. So when we went out to go film last week, um, out here in this part of Nebraska, we've been really dry. So our black-eyed Susan don't look this healthy. Um, I'll, there'll be, a, I think there's another picture later that I have. So these were taken from years past, but um, black-eyed Susan is one that we like to put in our plantings because we can see them. Um, it's something that a landowner likes to see. And you can see this one come on, you know, fairly quickly. Definitely does have more of that black-eyed center and just a really nice little plant that kind of comes on and you can kind of see it right away. The native biennial or a short-lived perennial? Um, this is blanket flower. This is another one of those that we like to use, a native perennial that we like to use. And what's been really cool the past couple, three years, and when I've been out doing site visits on our CRP sites, is we've really started to notice some, maybe some hybridization that has started and we've started to see more of them um, with a lot more of this yellow ring that's a lot wider and I've actually seen some that are all yellow. I don't know if I saw them on yours, um, but there was several of them that, we've actually seen some that they're all yellow. Um, you think it's a sunflower and you go to look at the center and it's, it's a blanket flower. So um, this picture right here has been really cool. Um, it's along a, a CRP field that I go by every once in a while, um, and year after year, that clump is still there that they keep mowing around it. So I thought that was really cool that they, they like that clump. Um, one of the things that we've kind of heard that um, from one of our soil cons, when I started working with her, she said um, the old wives' tale is, is when the blanket flowers start blooming is when you start to hear the quail start to sing in the, in the summer. This is um, Baldwin's ironweed. This is one that we'll get on later in the summer. Um, and it's one that gets to be this really pretty purple. And in the middle photo, you can see that there's a pretty nice bumblebee on top of that. And um, it's just one of those really nice ones that you'll see later in the summer that's um, purple and maybe not necessarily just yellow. Goldenrods, anytime that we're trying to do pollinator plantings, we want to include some kind of a goldenrod. Um, Canada goldenrod will glow, grow here. Um, the picture on the right is the stiff goldenrod. And then in the front of that, the pretty purple is the hoary vervain. So we always try to incorporate some kind of a goldenrod in most of our plantings, especially when we're doing them for nesting habitat and root cover. This is a plant, um, I don't know the whole pollinator value to it, but it's a really fun plant when you're out in the field. This is fragrant cudweed. Um, it's either a native annual or a winter annual. And what I really like about this plant is when you walk through it, it smells like maple syrup. So even when it kind of starts to dry down, it, when you first pick it, it smells like celery. And then the further it gets into the summer, then the more it starts to smell like maple syrup. We tried drying some to see if it stayed that way. It didn't. Sad day. Um, this is another one. This is goat's beard or Western salsify. It's a naturalized biennial. This is the one that I call that it looks like a dandelion on steroids. It has this pretty little yellow flower and they can get, that's a pretty small bloom. Um, and then they can usually get really big and have more of a head like a dandelion when it goes to seed. I have this out in front of my house that just, just comes up by itself. But I've just, I've had a few seeds pop up and they, um, they grow and I just let them grow. I, just, I can't pull them. I can't. They're still calling me to me. So that's goat's beard or Western salsify. This is one that you'll see um, a little bit sooner in the spring. This is hood's flocks. It's a native perennial. Um, it's a low growing plant. It likes it's more of a ground um, creeper but it stays really close to the ground um, and doesn't get real tall. It's white. Um, this one I don't see very often, but I think it's really one of the early ones that we start to see. 
Hori vervain is another one that we typically like to try to put Hori vervain in almost every um, nesting cover and brood cover mix that we have. This one is really pretty purple. Um, it attracts a lot of the pollinators that we want to bring in. The, the bees and the butterflies and the moss seem to like it. I have also seen them when they're more of a lavender and we've, I've also seen them fade clear to completely to white, um, which is really kind of fun to see. So there are some, a little bit of color variations when you get out to the field. I think it could be based on the soil type. I don't know. Sounds good. Sounds smart, right? Um, this is Illinois bundle flower. Uh, when we were out doing a site visit on this, this is one that we typically don't find in Southwest Nebraska a lot. Uh, the heavier soils like Illinois bundle flower. And this was on that Corners for Wildlife project where we found the shrub thickets at doing so well. And we happened to stumble across this plant and, um, and it was Illinois bundle flower. But in central and eastern Nebraska, you find it a lot more frequently than we do here. But like I said, um, the heavier soil types seem to like um, in the Illinois bundle flower than the sandy, than the sandy sites do. This is Lambert's loco weed. This is a native perennial. There are several different kinds of loco weed. Um, it's kind of another one. This one can be kind of more of a ground, close to the ground type plant. And it's just one of those purple that you'll see early in the, the spring and early in the summer. Um, Addie said she's actually seen them where they're pink and white also. I think I have too. Yeah, and it could be very well be a different species. Lead plant is another one that's a native perennial shrub. Um, and if you're thinking about trying to do a backyard garden, lead plant, black eyed Susan, blanket flower, purple cone flower, a lot of those plants, the reason they do so well is because they don't take a lot of water and they don't take a lot of maintenance and then they love the full sun. So if you are trying to go back to more what they call a zero scape garden, a lot of these plants will do well for you because they do, um, once they get going, they don't need a lot of water and they don't need a lot of maintenance. So, and then they're a perennial plant, so you don't have to plant them every year like you do annuals, like you do your pansies and your geraniums, um, your little vincas, you know, just the typical things that you get to plant yearly. Um, so these perennials, you can plant them once, you might spend a little more money on some plants, but you'll have them for a longer time. Milkweed. This is one of them um, that is so important during National Pollinator Milk um, Pollinator Week because milkweed is vital to our monarch um, butterflies and their reproduction. Milkweed plants are the only plants that the monarch butterflies will lay their eggs on. This is a common milkweed plant. Typically, we see the common milkweed more in eastern and central Nebraska, and I'll show you the one that we have more in. Um, Southwest Nebraska, and I, I saw them a lot when I was in Wyoming and South Dakota. So, and that's our showy milkweed. Um, this is one of the few things that is blooming out here right now while it's dry. We, you're seeing a lot of thistles that are blooming. There are some native thistles that are blooming and the butterflies and the moss and the bees love thistles. It's not the greatest thing that we want as landowners, but they do love the thistles. They really are attracted to them. So one of the things that we kept seeing on our, on our wildflower walks was showy milkweed was blooming great and the thistles were blooming really great. Um, this is a find we found yesterday. I started was doing some more scouting yesterday and I did see sand milkweed. And this one is um, a white, has a white flower instead of a pink flower. And it has a tendency to, instead of just growing straight up, it has a tendency to grow parallel to the ground. So it sticks out more like this instead of sticking out like this. And then I've got a video of this one. So uh, definitely does like the sandier soils. That's definitely where I have found it at is um, we found it down by Ender's Lake um, is where we've seen it at. And, and, it, and you will see it in those sandy ditches. So here is a video of the sand milkweed. And I actually took this one yesterday when it was really bright. I am really amazed it videoed so well. Hey, bud. Are you watching? Well, so this is a video that shows the sand milkweed. This is one of the milkweed plants that Grandma found out in the ditch yesterday. And that's cactus. And then there's a cactus. That's right. That's prickly pear cactus. It has a really pretty flower. I'm going to show you here in a little bit. You want to go home now? Can I go back to mom? Um, this is narrow leaf beard tongue. 
This one, I don't always see out here, and it's definitely one that you'll see earlier in the spring. This beautiful blue. Yeah, beautiful. the narrow leaf has got a beautiful kind of a blue purple tint to it. Um, we also have uh, another beard tongue out here that's either na uh, narrow leaf maybe or white, that they're more of the white blooms on them. Um, so this is another one that we do see sometimes out here. This is one of my favorite that come on later in the summer. Pitcher sage, it's a native perennial. This is one of my all time favorites because this is one of the few things that is not yellow um, in that late summer, early going into fall. And it can be really big, um, but the bees uh, and the insects love pitcher sage. Um, sometimes they call it blue sage, um, but it's absolutely one of my favorite, favorite ones of all. I really like that one just because it's just different in, the, in that late summer. This is Plains Bee Balm. This is a native annual, and this one will be typically mostly a white bloom, and they kind of have a tendency to stack on top of each other. And this is another one that we like to use because the bees do like it. Um, Plains Bee Balm, it can be pretty little, and sometimes it can get to be pretty tall. The other plants that we like to include in our plantings is some kind of a primrose. So there's definitely, there's different, three different kinds of primrose on this slide. There's four point evening primrose, which I've started using a lot more here, especially in our sandy sites. Common evening, evening primrose is popular. And then the lavender leaf primrose is blooming really well right now. They said, especially in your outcroppings and kind of in your little bit more mag sites. So they have that bigger, kind of that bigger, blossom on them. Um, but the four point evening primrose, you could definitely tell that they definitely have like four points on their um, their blossom. And then this is the common evening primrose over here. So primrose is another plant that's really important for us to put in our pollinator and our um, habitat plantings. This is a prickly pear. This was actually just taken last week. Um, I saw the little green bee in there when I was taking the picture, but I didn't see the other bee. Do not ask me what kind of bee they are. I have no idea. Um, they're just bees. So, but it was really striking. It was this beautiful big bloom, you know, about the size of a grapefruit um, bloom that was really pretty. And you go to look at those blooms and they all have something, you know, on them. So they all have some kind of an insect, whether it's an ant or whether it's a bee or a wasp or flies. We see a lot of flies on the plants too, and a lot of the ants on them. Prickly poppy. Most people don't think that um, prickly poppy as being a plant that's a good pollinator plant. They, it's prickly and it's not very pretty, but when you go to open these open blooms, they've always got something in there um, in the middle of those blossoms. There's always flies or little ants or gnats or something in them. So there's always something in those prickly poppy blooms. Purple pincushion cactus. Um, these are usually pretty little and really set close to the ground. Um, most of the time you walk right over the cactus and don't notice them until they bloom. And then they've got this big, beautiful um, pink to fuchsia colored um, bloom on there. And that's when you really start to see those pincushion cactus is when they finally start to bloom. Purple coneflower. This is a native perennial. Um, we don't see this one a lot out here in our part of the world. I think it's another one that has a tendency to do a little better, maybe where it's a little wetter, um, maybe more humid. And um, these can just be a really nice plant to have out there. We just don't see them as frequent. I, in fact, I think these pictures I actually took in central Nebraska rather than in western. But I know I have seen them. I know I've seen them like in the McCook area that they do pop up. But um, that's your echinacea. And that's another one of those that you can use in your um, in your backyard for a xeriscape plant. Purple prairie clover, any of the prairie clovers you can put into a planting are vital. Um, the bumblebees like them. It just gives you that great purple color when there's lots of stuff that's yellow and white. And it's really big and open, so those bigger insects can get to those um, cones a lot easier on those clovers. Maximilian sunflower. If anybody knows Bruce Sprague from Eastern Nebraska, ask him what his favorite flower in the world is, and I bet he won't tell you it's Maximilian Sunflower. 
absolutely does not like Maximilian Sunflower because in eastern and central Nebraska, it's very, in and very invasive. Um, we have a tendency to plant it out here because it, it's not as invasive unless you get to a heavier, wetter site. Um, so we can use it out here a little easier in western Nebraska than they can in central and eastern Nebraska. This is just an interesting plant um, that if you're out walking, you might not know what it is. It's called Pussy Toes. It's a native perennial, um, definitely a ground cutter cover. It stays really, really close to the ground. Um, so that's just an interesting plant that some people don't always know what it is. So I just wanted to keep it in here so people knew what it was. Rocky Mountain bee plant is another native annual. The bees love it. As you can see um, in the left-hand picture, there are two bees, at least two bees that you can see. Uh, and this one is always fun. Usually if you see this plant, it's kind of big and bushy, um, like it shows in the right-hand side. A lot of times you'll see sunflowers with it, you know, alongside of it growing. And it just kind of pops up in the pastures too. We plant it in our plantings, but this is definitely one that you'll see popping up in your pastures and your ditches. This is sandy dock or wild begonia. You definitely see this in the sandy roadside ditches. Uh, it's usually one of the ones we see early in the spring and it's really, it really looks like a begonia. So if you've ever had begonias in your yard, they really look like those begonia plants that you have in your yard. Um, really pretty coral colored, um, but definitely I've always just seen it a lot of times in the ditches. We don't necessarily plant it in the planting, but it does grow just out here on its own. Scarlet globe mallow is another small orange colored plant that we'll see early in the spring. Um, this one's just nice. It doesn't get real tall either. It can be a little bit closer to the ground and just a nice another orange blossom that we like to see in our plantings. This is another one we will plant in our plantings. This is shell leaf penstemon. This is another native perennial, great one for your yard if you're wanting to do xeriscape. Um, most of the time they're lavender. We have seen some that have been a really beautiful light pink and then they kind of fade to white. This, um, we found several remnants of it, which you can kind of see back here. This is the remnants of it when it finally, when it loses all of its petals and starts going dormant. That's what the pods look like. So you can kind of find those fairly easy in the field that you know that you've had rem remnants of shelly penstemon out there. And then sometimes you'll see them um, growing like that. This is actually in a pasture. So um, yeah. And when I first started doing my habitat tours, one of the guys that I talked to, he says, Heather, what is that? And we were able to say, well, that's shelly penstemon. And he was amazed how well it he came back because it was like in the summer of 2013 and 14 after we had the two droughts. So we had horrible drought here in 12 and 13 and definitely saw that the next couple years it came in, you know, pretty good. This is a silver leaf scurf pea. This is a native perennial that you'll start to see um, in some of the ditches and some of the rangeland. It's a real silverly, you know, silver gray leaf plant, and that that plant in the stem is all kind of that sagey color green. So this is just another one that we happen to see when we're doing site visits. Spiderwort. Um, Spiderwort's one of my favorite ones too. I showed it to my friend Gwen last night. We love showing this one to the kids and talk about why um, some of the plants are named what they are, because when you break the stem on the spiderwort and you pull it apart it'll string across like a spider web or it gets ooey and gooey like cow, cow slobbers. Um, so I love having spider wart when we're with the kids and we're doing education programs with the kids because you can talk about this is maybe kind of one of those reasons and maybe it's named spider wart because it kind of looks like a spider web. Um, the picture here, this is actually what it's looked like after it's dropped its bloom. Um, so we happened to run across this one last night and then this is the prairie spiderwort. And then this other one um, is erect dayflower, which is another spiderwort. But you can definitely see the difference in the petals, that there's only two petals on the erect dayflower, and then there's three petals on the prairie spiderwort. And if I remember correctly, the spiderwort only blooms for so many days. I'm sure Clusterman will correct me if I'm wrong. 
This is another one. This one's always just fun to say. Um, this is um, the stemless hymenoxus. It's a native perennial and it kind of grows in little bunches and it you'll definitely see it on outcroppings. Um, if you live in southwest Nebraska and you're around the Enders area, this is usually up at the observation point at the lake, at Enders Lake. You'll usually see this one growing in the outcroppings up there. So it kind of likes those maggy, gravelly, rocky sites and they'll just be kind of growing up out of there. Sunflowers. Um, I am horrible, horrible, horrible at identifying sunflowers. I just know they're a sunflower. Don't ask me which one they are because I just don't know. Um, but there are several different sunflowers that we have and the bees obviously love sunflowers. We love to put those in our habitat plant things. They're really important for us to have. Um, like I said, then the bees love them. Upright coneflower. This is, we're gonna do a little bit of this about the coneflower when we go to do our make and take project. But we have different, several different kinds of upright coneflower. The two we have here is the regular yellow on the right that you normally see. And then we also have the one on the left that's called Mexican hat. It's still an upright coneflower, just a different name because of the different color of the, the petals on the plant. And we've actually seen some that have a, a little bit of burgundy on them and a lot of yellow on them. So upright coneflower is a fun one for us to have. Um, that we always look for and you'll see this in the pastures in the rangeland as well. Uh, Western wallflower is a native biennial and we usually see that early in the year. Usually this time of the year it's already gone here in southwest Nebraska. So this is another nice yellow one that a lot of times you'll see this growing really well in the ditches. This is another one of our early bloomers that we um, put in there, Western Yarrow. This is another xeriscape plant that you'll see. This is a white version. <clears throat> I know there's some yellow versions of Yarrow that especially you'll see in your, um, your gardens and your backyard areas that you'll see more of a yellow one. I really like this plant. You can't really see it in either one of these pictures, but the base of the leaves when they're coming on are really, they look a lot like ferns and they're really soft. So when you go to touch them, they're, they are a really soft um, plant. This is wild bergamot. This is a native perennial. Um, I've started typically using this a lot more in our plantings, especially if it's a heavier kind of a gravelly site. Uh, I've been using this wild bergamot. The bees love bergamot. Um, it's kind of similar in the way their blossoms are to the plains bean balm. So it is just a different color. So they are usually, you know, that purple color and kind of fade to white when they um, are at the end of their blooms. I am, this is just a grass. I wanted to just highlight this one um, as we've really seen it, especially in Eastern Chase County. Um, Downy Brome, it's an annual introduced cool season grass. It's really starting to die off now. It's all dying off brown. But um, this is one of the things when it turns off dry, this stuff can just grow. This is like crazy. Yes, it could be. Uh, fire whistle's going off here in town, so uh, we're hoping it's nothing major. Um, but they also know it as cheatgrass or wild oats, but it's downy, downy brome is what it's called. This is another video that I'm going to show. This is the Corners for Wildlife site where you saw the shrub planting at. This, like I said, this was planted in 2018. 2018 in this area where this one was planted, um, it had a lot of rain that spring. And there's a, actually a part of it, they actually thought maybe the seed got washed away because we'd had so much rain. But um, it's come along really well. We'll see if we can get this video to work again. Um, but this just kind of shows you it's right next to a cornfield. And this kind of just shows you what this looks like. The, a lot of times our nesting cover um, and our brood cover patches, they really just look like a great big weed patch. But essentially they're not a great big weed patch. It's different kinds of shapes of plants that we need out there for those baby chicks. And the other importance of the pollinator plantings, the reason we're planting these blooming flowers in these pollinator plantings is because it's bringing in the insects that help to, to feed and raise our baby chicks, pheasant, quail, turkeys, songbirds. Um, there's just so many things that rely on insects and that's exactly why 
we want to plant all these blooming plants into these um, habitat plantings, it's vital for those chicks to have those insects for the first six weeks of their life. So that's the other reason that it's so important to Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever to plant these blooming plants into our habitat project. This is a new thing kind of for Southwest Nebraska. We have not done a lot of prescribed burning in the past. We did get a landowner to do a prescribed burn. We actually had two prescribed burns that we got pulled off in Chase County last spring. And this is a really cool photo. Um, this is something that we like to start using in our habitat areas is to put in these great, beautiful um, green fire breaks. And the biggest thing for planting them is their great brood cover. So when we're talking about brood cover, brood cover is 75% of the mix is these green plants that are growing early in the spring, like alfalfa, red clover. We put blue grama and prairie june grass in them. We like to put in those grasses and those legumes that don't get real tall. So we don't like to use yellow blossom sweet clover in them because yellow blossom sweet clover gets so tall and so rangy. So red clover will work better. Um, but these green fire breaks are great for brood cover, but they're also great because then the landowners can mow those off and maintain them. And if he decides to go burn this for his mid-contract management for CRP in the future, he can mow that off and have a great place, um, a green fire break to burn off of. So in this picture here, this was how that field looked in April of 2019 before they burned it. The next picture to the right, is actually during the prescribed burn and we're um, they're lighting right off of that disc line um, to start that fire to get the prescribed burn to go and then down in this corner over here this was right after it was burned and one of the things that he did notice the landowner noticed there was a lot more gopher holes out there kind of looked like a moonscape um, but as you can see it's recovered really well and um, the grass has come back. The green fire break on this side, on the west side of this piece of property has done really well. There's um, the part of it that's on the south side of this field has not done as well, but the soil type is a lot different. So we don't know if that's part of the reason that just hasn't come on as well. Um, we also wondered if it maybe ran, what moisture they would get would run down the hill and maybe that green fire break area just did a little better because it's not, it's not irrigated on this side over there. I don't think it was, was it? That wheat field was dry land. Yeah. And then, so this is part of our wildflower walk. Um, I'll turn this video on and this is that, that green fire break area we were in, the picture that was just there. And we'll just kind of go take a walk and see what we see. There's a lot of alfalfa in this. And there's also a lot of yellow blossom sweet. But this plant right here, that's a milkweed plant a pretty small one, but it's there. There's another plant there. The next plant that we are gonna see is the blanket flower. It's been pretty tough on our blanket flower. It's just been so dry. So they've dropped their petals. The next one is, um, you can't see it as well, but that's yellow blossom sweet clover. It wasn't in the mix, um, but it was out in that field prior to. And then the purple that you're seeing is the alfalfa. And then this just shows you some of the other grasses that are coming into this green fire break that he'll be able to mow in the future and be able to use that um, as a great fire break. And then there's the Black Eyed Susan um, on the eastern part of Chase County. They were doing a lot better than the ones out on the western side. But there's also upright coneflower in there. We found that blooming pretty good and was really tickled to see the milkweed coming in there on its own. This is um, the same field. So this would be the area right next adjacent to the green fire break. This is actually what it looked like before it burned. And this was just burned a year ago. And the warm season grass has come back on really well. So you can see big stem, you know, big blue stem out there. There's a little blue. I'm sure there's switchgrass out there. I didn't go walk into it a lot, um, but it has recovered really well. And this was burned to black last um, in April. So just a little over a year later, we're back to 
How, how tall would you say that stubble was or that grass was yet last night? Probably 20 inches. Probably, you know, at least knee high. So it recovered really well. But we had some really nice rains right after we had those burns. Um, it was kind of dry beforehand, but then it, we had some really timely rains after that. So <clears throat> this is a slide that shows um, the Pheasants Forever and the Quail Forever chapters that are in Nebraska. This is just something I wanted to share with you that if you're already a PF or a QF member, thank you for your continued support of our conservation efforts. We appreciate it. If you want to become a member, contact myself or Ashley. Um, her email is on here for a membership application and we'll get one to you. But these are some of the things that we've done in Nebraska. We've spent $81.8 million spent on habitat projects, habitat equipment, and youth education since 1986. Over 6 million acres of habitat have been improved, maintained, and enhanced since 1986, and over 128,000 habitat projects have been done with private landowners. So it's really important for us to keep up um, the support of our members. Our, it's a membership-driven program. It's a volunteer program, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, and we absolutely rely on our volunteers and our chapter members. They're vital to our organization. This is a fairly current map of um, the wildlife biologists we have in Nebraska. We have several of our biologists are on the call this evening. So if you're not from Southwest Nebraska, um, if you're from another part of the state, which I know we have some folks on, there are biologists across the whole state. When I started um, in 2013, I think we had 12 bio bio wildlife biologists, and I think we're up to 16 now. And we also have some great new positions within our organization um, that have been a tremendous help to the landowners, the private landowners that are in Nebraska. This is some information that I have. Most of you have my information. And I'm just so glad that you guys could reach out and join us this evening for this habitat tour on a, on a virtual platform instead of being able to be in the field. It's been an interesting way to educate folks, but it's a great way to get folks from Shadron and Ainsworth and Beatrice and Fairbury and Grand Island in on the call with us this evening. So we really, we really appreciate you taking the time to get on with us this evening. Um, and then the next thing we're gonna roll into, I know we, we'll probably lose some folks here, but um, we're gonna roll into our make and take. 